How we doing this morning? Y'all, we doing good? Man, y'all look amazing. You sound amazing. I don't know about you, but can we just, um, golly, can we just honor the worship team right now? Can we just honor the worship team? Man, I also want to, can we also, can we honor uh, Pastor Jim and Pastor Casey? Come on. Tell you what, there, to me, there's nothing more attractive than people that just carry a spirit of humility. And uh, the two of them up here, it was like palatable in the room. So much so that when they were communicating together during the host moment, who was in the room for the host moment, by the way? Put your hands in there. Were you feeling what I was feeling or is it, it, am I like, am I just getting older and more emotional? But my, my heart was, was so moved. Um, man, I just love it. It's, it's this humble confidence. You know, you know who you are, you know why you're here, you know where you're going, but you, you just carry, both of you just carry so much humility. It's so contagious and attractive and it just points me back to God and I needed it. That was like the thing that, that, that recalibrated me this morning. So I honor you guys and uh, y'all look amazing. It's going to be a great day. Uh, I do want to just take a second. Um, I love our, our church is so generous. Um, this is what's so cool about generosity is he, he uh, somebody in our church gave me these and they're like, hey, would you give these away to, to first, first time guests? And I'm, I'm like, that's amazing. I mean, this is, like, this is like what God does with us. He gets it to us so then he can get it through us. Like I'm giving these away today, but I'm not really giving them away. Somebody gave them to me. Do you see what I'm saying? This is, this is really the heart of God and so, um, I do just want to give these away to some first time guests today. Want to honor them. Uh, who likes Chick-fil-A that's new today? Come on, anybody in the, in the room today that likes Chick-fil-A? Oh, somebody up top. Ray, Ray, can you come help me out, Ray? Come on. Let's give it up for Ray, by the way. Come on. My guy, Ray, on the camera, serving Jesus. Love it. You know who, I, I didn't see who it was, so yeah, okay, great. How about Panera Bread? Anybody? Come on. I like a little, a little Panera sandwich. Okay, right over here. Yeah, right here. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Let's give it up for Mr. Jeff Cookie. Come on. So good. Um. No, this is not a bribe. This is just God's heart. I. We just. I mean, anybody thankful? Just there's something really powerful about generosity. I just feel like I. I brought gifts today to just keep on. I guess they're, they're just falling from heaven today. I'm gonna. So today. Today I'm preaching a message out of John chapter 13, and the, the title of the message is Lead Different, and uh, a, a little over a week ago I hosted an event called the Lead Different Experience, and these were the hats that we had made. Um, they say lead upside down, you get it? Like lead different? Yeah. Yeah. People are like, why, why is lead upside down? Because we're trying to communicate a message without communicating a message. Oh! Uh, so good. Hey, Mason, where you at, man? Mason, come get a hat, bro. Let's give it up for Mason. My guy, my guy reached out and wanted a hat. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to be generous and just give the man a hat. There you go, bro. Come on. Enjoy that. Who else rocks hats in here and actually wants this thing? I see. Yeah, right here. Your hand just went way up. So here, can, can somebody? Yeah, right there. Uh, yeah, I love it. Come on. All right, that's enough of the gift giving, but we do serve a generous God. Can I get an amen in here? Um, uh, so, so good to be with you guys. We are a simple church. They, they shared the vision with you, and it's really, uh, I just, it, it, it baffles me how cool God is that 16 years ago, Pastor Todd and Denise Doxson left Fort Lauderdale, Florida to start this church. They started in a basement, and here we are, and you just look around at the faithfulness of God. And um, I'm just moved every time and considered an honor to be a part of this vision in this house. So thank you all for the opportunity to be just in the pulpit. I think this message today and really the heart of this message, it means so much to me because I wouldn't be here in the room if somebody wouldn't have challenged me to do what I'm gonna challenge you to do today. Um, I remember being in Los Angeles, California when pa Pastor Frank Ramsour looked at me and he said, you know what, there's a cool thing happening in Omaha, you should go serve and start studying God's word. And I'm like, you know what, that's not a good idea, but I think it might be a God idea. So 
I guess I'll go do that. I was living in Los Angeles, California, y'all. Give me some grace. I mean, come on, 75, sunny, and then coming here to the Midwest? Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's starting to get a little bit colder. You know what I mean? Um, anyways, it is, uh, it is a privilege, and we are this year in the Gospels, working through the Gospels in the book of Acts, and we are in, in John. Uh, I, love, I love the Gospel of John. It's, it's personally my favorite Gospel. I love reading the Gospel of John. Uh, this book has always just uh, spoke to me so loudly and clearly. And the author of this, of this Gospel is John. And John wrote some other books, but uh, John was the apostle that was like, yeah, like Jesus loves me the most. You know what I mean? Like, talk about like a humble brag. I mean, my goodness. Um, but I love this guy, and we're picking up here now in, in the section of scripture where Jesus, the, and really this gospel, what's cool about this gospel is this, this gospel lays out uh, some of Jesus, some of Jesus' story before his death. Like, there's a lot, there's a lot here, and we're starting to get into that um, as, we, as we look at our, our text today. So let's pray and let's jump in. Can we do that? Father, thank you so much for your word. And I just pray that over the next few moments, you would encourage our hearts, that you would, uh, that you would speak to us. We know that your presence is in the room and you know where each of us are at today. You know exactly what we need. Pray you'd be our teacher, our coach. Pray you'd encourage us, convict us where we need conviction. I know I wanna leave different. So, Lord, would you just speak? I, I submit my mouth to you, and I pray that you would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, um, I want you to, to raise your hand in here if you are a parent. Any parents in the room? And keep it up, keep it up. You're gonna get a little workout this morning. Okay, wow, everybody look around. Lots of parents in the room. Any grandparents in the room? Grand no, keep your hands up, parents. Parents, I didn't tell you to put them down. I told you, you're getting a workout this morning. Any grandparents in the room? Grandparents? All right, older siblings. Older siblings in the room. Oh, there's some more hands going up. I love it. Um, any small group leaders? Team leaders? No, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Nobody's putting their hands down. If your hand's up, it's staying up. Sorry, parents, you're getting the real, real, real workout this morning. Any business owners in the room? Business owners. Been business owners in the room. Anybody lead a department? Like you oversee, okay. Now I'm looking at a room full of people that are raising their hand. I feel like I should call on some of you right now. No, go, you can go ahead and put your hands down. Literally every hand in this room was raised. And so when I look around the room, I think, what's the thing that, that you all have in common? You can talk in church. There, there's people that are following you. If you raise your hand, if you're a parent, a grandparent, if you're a teacher, if you're a coach, if you are a, a business owner, um, there's all, you're an over, older sibling. If you raise your hand in here, there, there are people that are following you. And if there are people that are following you, what does that make you? It makes you a leader. And uh, I, I'm passionate about leadership. And I get it, you know, you'll hear it in culture now, like, oh, we should talk more about followership than leadership, because you gotta be a good follower, and yes, you can't ever lead anybody well until you are first a great follower, yes and amen. But here's, may I submit, just uh, uh, one of the issues that I see in culture right now is that there's a lot of people that when you start talking about leadership, they check out because they have not identified as a leader. But can I tell you, if John Maxwell's definition of leadership is true, then all of us in this room are leaders. And John's definition is that leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. The question is, is if you rose your hand in here just a second ago and you said, I'm, I'm in one of these roles, the reality is, is there's somebody that's following you. In essence, there's somebody that you have influence over. In other words, you're a leader. Have we established that? Because I can't move any farther in this message until I convince every single person in here that you are a leader that's been called by God, commissioned. And here's what I know is that in this room, there are different capacities of leadership. Some of you are called to lead maybe just your family. Maybe, maybe that's what your call is. You're, you're called to lead, lead four people faithfully. There are some of you that are called to lead a group of 15 
You, you know, raise your hand, group leaders, once again. Come on, you're opening up your homes. You're saying, come on in. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's give it up for our group leaders right now. So grateful and thankful for them. There's some of you that are, that are called to lead hundreds. Some of you may be called to lead uh, thousands. I was just talking to a CEO who runs a company of 30,000 people. I mean, that's a lot of people. He's leading a lot of people. That's a lot of responsibility. But it doesn't matter whether you're, re whether you're leading 30,000 or three, you have to come to this place where you understand that you're a leader. Somebody say, I'm a leader. I'm a leader that I've been called by God for such a time as this. Now, the thing that I see, the problem that I see with leadership in our culture currently is that a lot of times in culture, most of, most of the leaders in our culture are more interested in being selfish than selfless. It, you know, we, we are more interested in, in pursuing position or prestige or chasing after success rather than living a life of significance. I remember... Uh, getting some time with John Maxwell and this illustration is etched in my mind when I think about leadership and he was telling this story about how you know he started pastoring and then he wrote some books and then he began speaking and he started speaking more and more and more and so he, he described his life as one that was climbing the ladder of success just chasing after the things that God put in his heart. And by the way, it was, it was good things. Good things. Somebody say good things. Good things. He's, he's climbing the ladder of success. And I know, I know, I know all the moms in the room right now, you're getting really <laughs> nervous. Just tune back in. It's going to be okay. I promise you, you're not responsible if I fall and break an ankle. We good? You with me? Should I step up one more? Huh? 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 Yeah. All the dads are like, stand on top of that thing with one leg. Throw your hands in the air, man. Let's go. But this is, uh, this is how John described his life. And he said that there was this moment where he felt like God had challenged him to stop being a ladder climber and move to being a ladder holder. Now, what's interesting is up here, man, y'all can see it. The light's shining on me pretty good, isn't it? Ooh, all eyes are on me. Yeah, does my jacket look good? Come on. See, this is, but this is what can drive us. If we don't have identity, we will continue to be a ladder climber, chasing success, chasing the limelight, chasing so that everybody can see us. As a matter of fact, some of us were still trying to prove that teacher that spoke a word over us in second grade. You know, as I think about the idea of leading different. Because I believe that that's what God is, is desiring in this season is for a generation of leaders to lead different. I remember being in a, in a room with Ron Dotzler about eight years ago when the seed was planted, this idea of leading different, when he looked at the room and he said, we don't need better leaders, we need different leaders. Somebody say, I want to be different. I want to be different. I want to be different. And the reality is, is when God challenged John to get off the ladder and become a ladder holder, here's what he said his temptation was. He said, you know what? I'm probably not gonna be able to have as much of an impact being a ladder holder as I was being a ladder climber. What he had realized was that he was chasing success, he wasn't chasing after significance. And I want you to know that when God challenges you and I, because I believe he is today, he's, he's challenging some of us in our parenting to get off the ladder and start holding the ladder. He's, charging, he's challenging some of us in here, some of us that are business owners, to hop off the ladder and start being a ladder holder. He's challenging some of us in here that are leading groups to, to, to hop off the ladder and start raising up other group leaders. The, the problem is what keeps you and I stuck right here from moving off the ladder to become a ladder holder are things like pride, insecurity. Ah, the, the, 
the, the, the attention feels really good. My soul is craving it and I don't want it to go away. So then as people are coming up underneath your leadership and you know, maybe it's time to, to let them pass or you're maybe pressing them down or using that power to stay in the limelight. But here's what I believe God is asking us to do today is to, just like Jesus, come on somebody, you wanna talk about the ultimate ladder holder? He left heaven way up in the sky. Perfection came to earth in the form of man, was born in a manger. Hello, somebody. And guess what? He laid down his life so you and I could find ours. He was the ultimate ladder holder. Now, here's the interesting thing is when John shares that story, he says that when he became a ladder holder, his influence went to a whole nother level. Isn't it interesting that when you and I catch this heart of being a servant leader, the impact, the influence, the impartation that can take place in our life is profound and it's significant. And I believe that this is what Jesus is inviting you and I into a, a different kind of leadership, a different kind of leadership, a, a leadership that isn't selfish, but a leadership that is selfless. I believe this today, that Jesus is teaching us in this passage in John chapter 13, that greatness, here it is, greatness is found in serving, not in status. Greatness is found in serving, not in status. Now, some context here to John chapter 13, I think it's really important because we read over in Luke chapter 22 that the disciples in this moment in the upper room had been arguing about who was the greatest. Do you remember this conversation? Do you remember reading this earlier when we were studying in Luke? They were preoccupied with thrones when they should have been focused on towels. They were preoccupied with thrones when they should have been preoccupied with towels. I love what Brian Bell, the way he says it, they were ready to fight for a throne, but not for a towel. I love this, though, because Jesus understands that this is what's happening. His, his, his posse, his team, his squad, the people that he's leading, they're having this argument about who is the greatest in the kingdom. And what's so interesting is Jesus, instead of lecturing them, he models what true greatness looks like. Do you want, do you want to see it in, in John chapter 13? Can we, can we check it out? I want to set this up here. Let's look at this. John chapter 13 Starting in verse one, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. So it's getting close here. It says this about Jesus, that he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, Simon, a son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything that he had come, and everything that he had came from God and, would re, and he would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped his towel, here it is, around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Now this is just crazy. You see this. I want you to think about this for a second. This is Jesus. Jesus was with God when God created the world. In other words, this is, this is the creator. The, the man who made these people is now wanting to wash their feet. Now, when I read this text, my, my heart and my mind is so blown and shifted and, and just overcome by this, this awe, really. It's this awe because when you think about the fact that Jesus, Jesus in this moment, was so filled with humility. This love that he's pouring out was so unconditional, meaning these disciples didn't deserve it. It was undeserving. They're having an argument about who's the, who's the greatest. They, they're, they're, none of them earned this, but, but Jesus in this moment gets low and begins to wash their feet. He takes the role of the lowliest position in that particular culture. You have to remember, they weren't walking around with white Air Force Ones protecting their feet. They had sandals. Their feet were open. They're walking on muddy roads. And you have, you know how grimy those feet were? Would you get down and start washing somebody's feet when they're grimy? I, I, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be, I, I probably can relate to the disciples. 
Of course they weren't, you know, hurrying up to grab the towel. Who wants to do that? I mean, come on. But the king of the universe gets low and begins to wash their feet one by one. Now, friends, when he gets to Judas, he doesn't skip right over Judas. Do you understand what kind of humility I'm talking about? Think about this. Some of you have so much unforgiveness in your heart. You haven't talked to that person for five years. This man is down on his knees, washing the feet of the man that's going to send him to the cross. Somebody say Lee different. Lee different. This is different. This is a different kind of leadership. And Jesus uh, tells the disciples in Mark 10, 43, I love this verse of scripture. He says, you are to lead by a different model. If you want to be the greatest, then live as one called to serve others. Here's what I want somebody to hear today. I don't know who said this first, but here's what it is. If serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. There's no other, there's no other brand of leadership. Leadership is servant leadership. There's nothing, there's nothing, uh, there's, there is no other kind of leadership. And so the question I want us to ask this morning is how can we follow Jesus's model of leading through service? Here's, here's where I'm going to give you the points. I want you to write these down. I'm going to give all three of, three of them to you now, and then we're going to go back through them. Number one is this. Servant leaders are motivated by love. Servant leaders are motivated by love. Number two, servant leaders are secure. And number three is servant leaders model what they want multiplied. I love this. Let's start with number one. Servant leaders are motivated by love. I want to read this uh, scripture for you again. John 13, one before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. I just said it a second ago. Jesus served out of unconditional love, not because his disciples deserved it. His love was undeserved. He served them even though they were arguing about greatness. His love was unending. He loved them to the end. His love was unselfish. He didn't serve to get something, but to give something. Here's what I want us to understand today is that the motivation of our service should always come from love. Now, in a second here, we're going to talk about the idea that servant leaders are secure, but there's a, there's a correlation here that I want us to understand that if you and I are not secure in our identity, then what we will do is we will, we will serve for love, not from it. Oh, I want you to catch this this morning. Somebody needs to catch this this morning, is that if your identity isn't secure in Jesus, then you will serve for love rather than from it. Oh, this, this changes the game for us in here. When you are serving your kids from love rather than for it, when you are serving uh, at your workplace from a posture of, I know who I am. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. I'm secure. My ID is in JC only because I'm secure. Now I can allow God's love to flow through me onto others. Is anybody with me today? There's a big difference. There's a big difference when we serve God from love rather than for it. I believe that this is the challenge that, that God is giving us. I was meeting with some young men, and uh, we were, uh, this past Wednesday, there's a, there's a group of young men that I invest in every other week, and we were having just different dialogue about how God's been challenging us in this season. And one of my friends was sharing how, um, man, we, because what we were talking about was the balance between like budgeting and generosity and like the tension that you live in as a, anybody with me, by the way, it's like, yeah, it don't make sense in the budget, but the Holy Spirit is asking me to be generous towards this person right now. So do I obey my budget or, or the king? You know what I'm saying? Like, can we just be real? Have you ever, have you ever felt that tension? Yeah, some of us in here, we, we, we got to follow that budget. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not just the, the bank account just isn't, isn't rolling. And so, so, so there's this tension that we live with. And, and my friend was sharing about how, you know, before he got married, he just, he was just so drawn to serving and loving on the homeless community. And he, he shared how, you know, that as he's gotten more disciplined and as, he, as he's, you know, tried to be a good steward and now he's, He's trying to lead his family and, and be wise 
uh, with the finances and all these different things is he, he started to notice that he wasn't noticing or being open to how God wanted him to move and serve this community that God had broken his heart for. In other words, he was, reserv- he was serving responsibility rather than being open to being generous with the king. So what's so interesting is he was sharing with me about how he recently had an opportunity to go and serve the homeless. And, and he showed me this, this video, this picture of it. And we were just talking about how if, if, if love is what is driving us, if love is going to be the standard, if we're going to if we're going to err on the side of responsibility or loving the people that God has called us to love, we're going to err on the side of loving the people that God has called us to love. Listen, friends, I want I want us to know today that love is a verb. It's action. It's actually going to cost you and I something. There's going to be sacrifice that's required. And something was stirred up in my heart when I realized that this man not only had to change his schedule, but he had to be intentional to get out of these seats, get into the streets, go buy a meal, go find some homeless people and begin to serve them. There's a lot of love and intentionality behind that decision. There's a lot of sacrifice that's attached to that decision. But here's what I know is that some of us love our comfort too much. The question is, is are we going to serve our comfort or are we going to serve God's purpose for our life? Friends, if we're going to be a a lead, different kind of leader, if we're going to be a leader that finds greatness in service and not status, it's got to be motivated out of love. So here's my challenge for us this week. I want you to examine. I want you to ask even right now, like, why am I serving? Am I serving from a place of love or am I serving for love? What's my motivation? Am am I seeking recognition or validation? And I want you to ask this question this week because here's what I know is that you and I, we will pre-decide things in our life that are important to us. Here's the question. Here's the takeaway. Where in your life can you show love through service this week? Here's what I know is that when love is the motivation to being a ladder holder, Jesus will do exceedingly abundantly above all we could think, ask, or imagine. There's some people in this place today that you're, you're going to experience a newfound joy, a newfound peace as you begin to allow agape love to flow in you and flow through you. Servant leaders are motivated by love. Is anybody with me today? Point number two is this. Servant leaders are secure. We see it right here in the text. John 13, three, Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything. And that he had come from God and would return to God. He knew. He knew. So because he knew, because he knew all this, because he was secure in this, because identity was connected to this. So he got up from the table. He he wasn't worried about his reputation. He wasn't worried about what he would look like. He got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples feet drying them with the towel he had around him. See, Jesus, Jesus had a clear understanding of his identity, which enabled him to serve without reservation. His identity helped him serve without reservation. He knew who he was. He knew where he came from, and he knew where he was going. Here, here's what I want us to catch with this point is that the insecure are into titles, but the secure are into towels. We're okay with getting low. We're okay with serving. We're okay of being of no reputation. Jesus didn't need to prove anything. He had nothing to lose and he had nothing to hide. I think about this, this, this idea of security. It reminds me of our lead pastor. I mean, many people in this room, you don't know this. He probably wouldn't even want me to tell you this. But I mean, he gave me the microphone this morning. So I guess I'll just ask for forgiveness ahead of time. Please forgive me. I'm not trying to steal his reward in heaven. But there's a lot of weekends that this man isn't up here in the pulpit. And you know where he's at? You know where your lead pastor is at on a Sunday morning? He's over there holding babies in the love kids area. 
This is what I'm talking about. This is a perfect picture of what I'm talking about. He, he's, he's, number one, the humility to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the mic to these young bucks. I'm going to, you know what? Yep, step in there and bring the word of God. You want to talk about humility? And then I'm going to sit in the front row and I'm going to cheer you on for one. And then I'm going to go over and I'm going to pray over and hug the next generation in this church. Come on. This is what I'm talking about. This is what it looks like to be secure, though. That doesn't happen if you're not secure. Because a leader that, that wants the limelight, the leader that wants to say, look at me, I've got it all together. The, le the leader that, that wants everybody to, to, to know that I'm the, one in, I'm the one in control. See all this? This is because, because I said yes. But that's the exact opposite of this man. And here's what I know. The Bible says that those who exalt themselves will be humble, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's so interesting because this is, this is the upside down kingdom. This is what we're talking about. There's some of you, you've been chasing after influence and impact by trying to climb the success ladder. Can I tell you, friend, get off the ladder today and start holding that thing out of a posture of humility and watch how in due season God will lift you up. I want to speak over the next generation. My good friend, Jordan Montgomery, who was just here speaking at the Lead Different Experience, one of my favorite lines, one of my favorite principles that he teaches is he talks about his own life. You could, those of you that were in the room, you heard his story that he, he, he had so much success at a young age that he started cutting corners. And he got called out when he started cutting the corners and almost you know, went bankrupt and lost all of his business. It was this, this really, um, go get the art of encouragement. You can read all about it in his book. But he says this, is that how, when he tells the story, he says this, I was overexposed and underdeveloped. See, I want us to catch this this morning because this is, this, is, this is so crucial. This is so crucial in here. We're, we're, raise your hand in here if you're part of Gen Z right now. Gen Z, where are you at? Next generation leaders. Put it up high in the air, Gen Z. I want to see every, I want to see every hand lifted up. Now, this is for everybody in the room, but I want to specifically, I want to specifically, I want to specifically speak this over you right now. Because... I believe God has created you to do great things. His word says it. He, he will take your pain and repurpose it for purpose. Like, I believe that he is, he is going to use every single one of you as you yield and open yourself up to him. But can I just tell you, you don't want to be overexposed and underdeveloped. You don't want the platform if you can't stay on it. Do you, have you ever... Have you ever you know, back in the day, I know Gen Z probably doesn't understand this, but you used to not just be able to take digital photos all the time. You used to actually have to get a, yeah, come on, everybody knows that. The disposable camera? Hello, somebody. Oh, I used to love taking those to Walgreens and like waiting two days to get it developed. Just the anticipation. Oh my gosh. And then you get them back and you're like, what in the world? Like, one out of 30 good photos. Are you with me, huh? You barely see your face, all this stuff. Man, it's a new world. Y'all better just say, praise God right now. Because, yeah, crazy. I mean, I, mean I, I feel bad for my parents. Like, their memories are just, I mean, it's like in a tub. I'm raising kids, and all my memories are on the phone. Like, all I got to do is go back to, like, 2015 in, like, two seconds and just, <laughs> they're growing so quick. Y'all got to, gotta like, you know, grab these 50 pound tubs and start pulling pictures out. Okay. Well, I'm totally digressing right now. And I got to shut, I got to shut this teaching down right now. But, but my point is this, when a photo was being developed in a dark room, if the light gets on it too soon, it's, oh, it's going to be exposed. It's not going to, it's not going to turn out. So I want to tell somebody in here today, trust God's timing. Trust God's timing. Because you want your character to keep you there when God begins to, to, to and I, I look at you, you're a perfect example of this. People, people, you know, talk about, and those of you that are new to the church, my man's platform has grown to over a million subscribers on YouTube. Like that's how many people he's influenced and talk about leadership, talk about stewardship, but you're the same guy. He's the same guy. You're the same guy. I remember you and I at his house on 180th street. 
This is when we first stepped into ministry. We didn't know what in the world we were doing. I don't know what in the world you were doing tapping us on the shoulder. But all we would do is like sit in this basement and cry out to God for hours. I remember it. You were, you were like, we were, I remember that. You were crying out for the more. And that more didn't come for almost a decade. You were being developed. And you know what's beautiful is because of that, I prophesy over your life, you're going to finish stronger than you started. Yeah, is anybody with me? We need a generation of leaders that don't just get on the stage or on the platform, but they stay on it. I want to see a generation of leaders, moms and dads, business owners, ministry leaders that don't just start the race, but finish it. Because greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world, and we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Come on, is anybody with me today? Are you feeling this thing? Somebody say, I'm a leader. I'm a leader. I want to lead different. Final point is this as we close, is, uh, is this, that servant leaders model what they want multiplied. See, Jesus was so st strategic in this moment because he didn't give them a lecture, but he actually modeled what he was going to call them to. And I love this because... This is also just a great principle. If you're a mom, a dad, if you're a business leader, whatever, you're a coach. I love the principle here because Jesus models it and then he comes back on the backside and he teaches and coaches it. It's such a good principle. John 13, 15, look at what he says a little bit further down. He says, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, here it is. This, he's talking to you and me here. So maybe elbow your neighbor, wake him up now, because this is for you. You ought to wash each other's feet. Some of the spouses in here are like, are you sure about that? <laughs> yes, I am. Jesus washed Judas's feet. Verse 15, I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done for you. Servant leaders model what they want multiplied. Jesus was, was modeling what it looks like to be, to be great. This is what greatness looks like, my friends. You, you guys are arguing over a throne. I'm going to grab a towel and I'm going to show you what greatness in my kingdom looks like. You know, when Jesus was asked, who is the greatest? He said, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you need to humble yourself like a child. Don't you love that picture of a child, the humility? And I love this because Jesus is modeling what he wants multiplied. Here's, here's what I want us to catch in this right now is that the people around you catch what you carry. If you model selfishness, it spreads. But if you model service, others will follow. Are you with me today? I, I want to I bring us back to this, to this thought because Matthew 23, 11 and 12 says this, that whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I love the, the there's, a, there's a translation of scripture that says this, do you want to stand out? Then step down and be a servant. I think that the, the invitation for, for those of us in the room today is that if we're going to lead different, we can't keep climbing the ladder. We've got to hop off the ladder and we've got to be a ladder holder. That as we hop off this ladder and become a ladder holder in this, in this season of our life, motivated by love, Secure and understanding that as we hold the ladder, we're giving other people permission to hold the ladder. Somebody's got to go first. And if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? I love the story of my son Judah. I mean, come on, somebody. I'm looking at a group that's ready. Somebody say, I'm ready. Judah, we moved into our house. You've heard this story before, 2021. It's the summer. We're throwing the football around. I can't remember how old he was at the time, but, but Judah at the time hadn't taken his training wheels off of his bike. So we're outside tossing the football. And next thing you know, there's a neighbor, there's a kid that's riding his bike, practicing with his daddy. So Judah looks at me and he says, Hey dad, I want to, I want to I wanna try. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, Oh boy, I'm about to take these training wheels off. And this is, I mean, Let's just, how about we just stick to throwing the football? You know what I mean? I'm, I was being that kind of dad. Yeah, not the fun dad, but, but I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to do it, son. Yep, so I take these things off. We get out in the front yard, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm just, I'm preparing myself for a workout. 
You guys have seen those dads that are like running with their kids, stumbling around, like look like they're gonna fall over, just unathletic, you know what I mean? I'm like, that's gonna be me. I'm gonna embarrass myself in this neighborhood before I can even get started at building a relationship. And so I get Judah on this bike, and I say, all right, here we go. And so he starts pedaling. I kind of run with him for a few steps, and then he just, just takes off. He's, he's riding down the street, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? This man was more than ready. Somebody say more than ready. He was more than ready, but here's the principle. Somebody had to go first. And because the neighbor boy went first, it gave Judah permission to go. I want us to stand to our feet because I want to see a group of leaders rise up. I believe today God has given you permission to go first. God is saying that in this hour, in this time in our country, in a divided world, come on somebody, we need a united church. We need a, a group of leaders that are going to stand up, that are going to say yes to his call. They're going to say, I I'm no longer going to be a consumer. I want to be a contributor. I'm no longer just going to sit in the seats. I'm going to go and serve in the streets. Is anybody with me today? Can you imagine what your neighborhood will look like? Can you imagine what your home will look like? Can you imagine what your business will look like if you'll lean into this? God, we thank you for the opportunity to model, to follow after the pattern that Jesus set for us. And Father, I just pray right now that you would move in our hearts this morning. We thank you that, that Jesus, you not only washed the disciples' feet, but you went to the cross. You died a criminal's death so that we could be restored back into right relationship. You served us even unto death. And so today in this room, God, we say thank you. Father, we say yes to the call of being a servant leader that's motivated by love, that's secure, and that begins to model what we want multiply. God, would you multiply servant leadership throughout the earth in homes, in businesses, in churches, in communities. And God, I pray as a result, we would start to see this world transform in Jesus' mighty name. Now, before I say amen, I believe that we would be remiss if we left this place without giving some of you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus today. Here's what I want you to know. Wherever you're at in this place, maybe you were invited by a friend. Uh, maybe you're coming back first time in a while. Here's what I want you to know today is what we prayed about earlier is that God sees you. God knows you. And, and it is true. You and I can never lead anybody until we first become a great follower. And I believe that today, some of you in this room, Jesus is inviting you. Jesus is inviting you to take that step and begin following him today. What it's going to require out of you is acknowledging your sinful condition before a holy God, recognizing that you could never make your way right, that you could never be good enough to earn your way to heaven, that you could never be good enough to earn a relationship with God, but God loved you so much that he left heaven and came to earth and lived the life that you and I couldn't and died the death that you and I deserved. Because of his finished work on the cross, because of, of, of how he proved who he was when he rose from that grave, now he invites you and I into relationship with him. There's some of you in the room today that, that you need to begin following the ultimate leader, that Jesus laid his life down so that you could live. I'm not going to speak any longer, but what it's going to require is for you to humble yourself. But here's what I want you to know is that God says, if you will acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my father in heaven. There's a there's a trans transformation that's going to happen in this moment as you step out in faith. So as the band plays, if I'm speaking to you in here today, come on, I, I know that I'm speaking to some people in this room today that you want to start leading. Uh, in your marriage a little bit better. You want to start leading your family, but today is the day that you got to first start following Jesus. So as the band plays, I want you to be bold. I want you to make your way up here because Jesus wants to give you the power to follow after his model. Come on, church. Let's begin to pray in this place today. If I'm speaking to you today, make your way forward. Come on.